it's 135. So we'll just get started. Last week, we wrapped up all the electron beam material interaction. You should know by the end of the class from last week, there are three types or at least three types of signals you can generate by the electron beam material interaction. Those are secondary electrons, backscattered electrons, and X-ray. In this class, we'll shift gears a little bit. We'll focus on the, uh, on the SEM alignment as well as image processing. So let's start by looking at the SEM beam alignment, the first part. In the lab demo, we've gone through that very briefly, but today we'll look at it in a more systematic way. So whenever you use SEM, whenever you use SEM, there are three things you need to correct. The first is focus. If the image is out of focus, it will be blurry. The second thing is astigmatism. The third, um, we've done the, uh, the demonstration in the lab is something called uh, column alignment, but to be more specific, this is the condenser aperture alignment. These three things we can control. There are also two types of uh, aberrations we cannot really control. The first is called spherical aberration. And the next one is called chromatic aberration. We will not discuss like these two uh, you cannot control. We will not discuss these two types of aberrations in this class. Uh, if you're interested in that, in the TEM class, I will discuss that more in details. Um, in today's class regarding the SEM beam alignment, we'll focus on focus as well as astigmatism. It's really difficult to draw the uh, condenser aperture alignment in terms of how it affects the image. Uh, I'll do um, the, uh, the demonstration again in today's lab, just to go through these three things again. So let's look at focus. I'm pretty sure in high school physics, or uh, if you've taken undergrad um, optics, uh, this concept is very easy. If we have a lens, and this is the optical axis. On one side, if we have parallel beam, then the convex lens will bend the other light and the light will converge into a single point. And this is your focal point. Vice versa, if we have beam going this way, that's parallel beam converging into a single point. If we look at the other direction, if we have light rays coming out from a point source in the other direction, if it happens at the focal point, then the light will come out as parallel beam. So this is very straightforward. That's something uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with. Then how do we form like a clear image?
again, we have the lens here. And this is the optical axis. Assume we have someone standing here. What happens is if we use the head as the point source, when the light or when the, the, the beam enters the, uh, the lens, it will bend and it will cross the optical axis at the focal point. Not only this light can bend, also we have another one which goes through the very center of the lens. I'll just use a ruler. We can further extend it. And on the other end of the lens will form an image of that person. Depending on the strength of the, uh, the lens, you can either magnify the, uh, the image or you can make the, uh, do you always magnify the image or you can make the image slightly smaller? Let me see. Yeah, you can either magnify the image or you can demagnify the, uh, the image. In this case, since the lens strength is fixed, if I put my camera or film like here, in this case, this will be out of focus. If I put my camera or film here, then it will be in focus. So focus is very simple. In SEM, what you can do, you can actually change the strength of the, uh, of the uh, lens. For example, you set the focal plane, uh, you set your specimen at a specific height, it's called working distance, then you change the, uh, the strength of the lens to make the image on the focal plane. So there's a very small difference of the fixed lens and the lens you can change via the strength. Any questions about focus? It's very easy before we move on to astigmatism. It's all clear? Okay. The second thing you correct in SEM is something we call astigmatism. If we look at the, uh, the projections, first, assume we have a 3D lens, but we'll look at the XZ plane, uh, X, XZ plane first. Oops. So this is Z, this is X. If we have an object and we have the parallel beam coming, it bends like, like this. So this is the focal point along the X axis. If we look at that 90 degrees away, so let's look at the uh, Y, Z plane. Again, we have the same lens and we have the object sitting here. What happens here is 
when the light passes the uh, the lens, it bends in a different way. And this is f y, f x, and f y. They do not have the same focal length. So what we have here is f x is not equal to f y. In this case, we have astigmatism. I'll try to draw that in 3D. Like now we know what it looks like in, in 2D. Now let's just try to draw that in 3D. So we have a plane like this. And we have another plane like this. So this is the Z direction. Then one is X, one is Y. So we can call this is X and we can call this is Y. In 3D, instead of having like a line, what we have on the other end is something circular. So let's just draw it here first. We have something circular like this. And this is the illumination. When the light enters the lens, let's just draw the center lines. What happens is the X direction ray will bend at one focal point. This is FX, but the light or the electrons coming from the Y axis, it will bend in this way. So this is FY. They do not have the same focal point. In this case, you have a distortion. If we draw, if we draw that, like, um, for example, if we converge the beam in SEM to uh, a spot, so instead of getting a circular spot, you get something elliptical. That's how the beam looks like. This is with astigmatism. If we successfully correct the astigmatism, we'll get a circle after that. Okay, that's good. So in this case, that's without astigmatism. By having astigmatism, you can distort your image. Your image can not be in quote unquote like in focus, although you've done your best focusing the image. If we break that down, we have two, uh, we have two knobs to control in SEM. That's X and Y. So if along X axis, if it's stigmated, the beam will look something like this. If there's no astigmatism, then it will be circular. And if it's Y stigmated, then it will look something like this. So in STM, you correct S and Y together to remove astigmatism. Um, as a trick, what you can do, or what I usually do, is I always go slightly out of focus. Then you will exaggerate astigmatism, which helps you to correct astigmatism. 
Does this make sense? Yes. Okay, great, cool. I will not uh, uh, draw the schematics of the column alignment. Uh, I'll show you that again in today's lab. Then we can move to, uh, we can move to, uh, to the second part of today's class. The second part of today's class is image processing. Image processing itself can be a class. Today, we'll only look at three things specifically, brightness, contrast, and gamma. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the, uh, the concept of brightness and the contrast. When we were doing the, uh, the SEM demo, um, the first thing we usually do is to do auto brightness and contrast. But what does, this, what does it mean actually in terms of like signals? Before answering that question, we'll look at what, a, what, what, what is an image fundamentally? So what is an image? Any image you look at, either a photograph or micrograph or um, like moving pictures, like in a movie, what you're looking at is a matrix fundamentally. So any image we have, they are composed of pixels. So the first concept you should be aware of is all images are um, made of pixels. Then how can we tell it's an image? For example, if we take a picture of the ocean, then the ocean will be, will be blue. Um, the, above the ocean, we have clouds. The clouds will be white. The reason is because for each color, there is a number assigned to the pixel. And this is how we know what the image looks like, or that's how we know how we interpret the, uh, the image in a mathematical way. And I'm pretty sure you're also uh, familiar, like, you know, with one bit, two bits, eight bits, 32 bits, these kind of terms. So, in a, in a gray scale or in a color scale, doesn't matter. Usually you have one bit. One bit, basically, there are two options. It's like flip, uh, flipping a coin, either up, uh, heads or tail. So in this case, it's black or white. To extend it, we have two bits. So in this case, we have four colors or four gray scales if it's black and white then we can extend it to 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit. By looking at the maths, you can kind of tell what is the number of colors when we have an image that's 32-bit. Any guesses? I don't need to know the exact number. Actually, let me give you a hint. For 8 bit, this is 256 colors. Any guesses just by looking at the trend? The powers of two. Exactly, exactly. Excellent. So we'll have two to the power of 32. And that is. 4,294, not 2 million, that's two, uh, sorry, 4 billion, 4 billion, then 294, 967, 296 colors. You can see how rich this can be in terms of information. Now we know what is an image, we can look at 
what happens when we adjust brightness, what happens when we adjust contrast, what happens when we adjust the, uh, the gamma. So adjust brightness. Mathematically, or in terms of matrix manipulation or matrix calculation, what you like what happens to the image is you actually add a constant to each pixel when you increase the brightness. So if you increase brightness, you add a constant or a number to all entries of the matrix. Assume it's a simple two by two matrix, like a picture like this. Initially, I have like maybe two, 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 and a zero. If you add a really large number, if you plus 200, then that's by increasing the brightness, what you have is 202, 202, 202, and a 200. This will be your new image. It's good and bad. Like, it's good in the way that it seems you have more signal, but this is not real signal. Um, the bad thing is you actually reduce the difference. Before, when it was two, 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 and a zero, there's a possibility your eyes may tell there's a difference. After just adding tons of um, um, brightness to the image, then the contrast will be reduced. If you recall in the very first class, we were saying contrast is delta intensity over I naught, like the original intensity. Before the, intens uh, the contrast was high, but now the contrast is not that high. Let me slightly change the number uh, to make the, ex the next example easier to illustrate. Two, 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 one, and this will be 201. Okay, this is brightness. If you reduce brightness, it's the same thing. Then you do subtraction. You subtract each entry of the matrix by a constant number. Okay, the next thing we discuss is adjust contrast. Then mathematically, what you do is you multiply a constant to all entries of the matrix. Oh, let me rephrase. When you adjust the other contrast, that's correct. You multiply a constant to all entries of the matrix. Let's use the other example again. We have two, 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 one. And if we, apply, uh, if we multiply that by three, that's to increase the, uh, increase the, the contrast, then the new matrix we have, or the new image we have with each pixel, it will be six, 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 and a three. When we do the, the contrast, we can multiply something bigger than one. Like in this case, in this case, we increase contrast. So let's go to the next page. So if we multiply something greater than one, then we enhance the contrast. If we multiply that something, um, the matrix by something less than one, then we reduce the contrast.
that's what happens to the image. Then how does this understanding help us when we acquire images or when after acquiring the image, like to further improve the representation of the image? Let's look at one example. Assume you have a dark spot in the bright background. If we look at the other line scan, just look at this line here. Let's plot the intensity. As assume at the beginning we don't have we don't have um, a good brightness contrast combination. Then initially it will be bright. Once it hits the uh, the dark object, intensity will reduce. Something like this. Then it will enter the uh, the bright region again. It will continue. We'll get something like this. Remember, like uh, when we talked about eight bits of images, we have 256 colors. In the intensity space, so this is intensity, very likely we're not effectively using the intensity space. So let's just plot the area we used in terms of intensity. We used this much. That's the intensity space we've really used, then assuming this is zero and this is 255, uh, it's not 250, uh, 256. The reason is because I didn't count starting from one, I started from zero. So zero will be the first one, similar like in Python, uh, the first entry is always one, it's not, uh, the first entry is always zero, it's not one. So we have this intensity space, But all these areas are wasted. So the green shaded areas, they are wasted intensity space. Then how can we use the intensity space more effectively? when you're operating the SEM or potentially while operating the TEM. The first step, the first step is to reduce brightness. Step one. Then if you reduce brightness, what are we gonna have? So with the same feature, If we reduce the brightness, we minus a constant number in, um, in the, uh, in, the uh, um, in the curve here. Actually, I, I made a mistake here. The first thing, if we are looking at the dark spot in the bright background, actually we should increase the brightness. You'll see why, you'll see why in a sec. So in this case, we'll have something like this. Um, I'm really sorry about it. I made a mistake in my note and let me correct it. We'll, we'll still reduce the, uh, we'll still reduce the, uh, the, uh, the brightness. Um, let's go back. I'm really sorry about it. Like, let's go back to this figure here. I'll leave it for you to think about the case which is demonstrated. Assume we have a dark background with a bright spot.
if we do the same thing, draw a line across, let's look at the intensity. Okay, we'll get something like this. Initially stuck, then we hit the bright feature. The intensity goes up and it continues like this. Then the effective intensity space we use is from here to here. And we're wasting this intensity space. So wasted. Again, it's from, assume it's eight bit, zero to 255. Okay, if you have this scenario, the first thing you do is to reduce the intensity. By reducing the intensity, you subtract the instant, uh, all the entries, like in the matrix, by a constant number, you'll get something like this. Basically, you shift this downwards by reducing the intensity. Then the second thing to do, step two, is to increase the contrast. As we, uh, as we discussed just now, when we increase the contrast, we multiply all the entries in the matrix by a number greater than one. When we increase the contrast, then what we have is something like this. In this case, we use the intensity space more effectively. So again, zero to 255. If we look at the intensity space we're using, it will be from here to here. And the wasted, the wasted intensity space is reduced. So should you bring your darkest pixel all the way down to zero? You can, you can, you can. Um, if you bring the darkest pixel to zero, all the way down to zero, when you increase contrast, then it will stay at zero. It will not shift up anymore. You can, but you run into um, a, a small problem because you don't know in the image which pixel is darkest. If you um, for example, like uh, you cannot go to negative. That's a really good question. You cannot go to negative when doing image processing. Let's assume the matrix we have is two, 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 one. And if you minus two for all the entries, let's do the identity matrix here. Okay, then in this case, on the image, what you have is zero, 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 zero. Um, what you said is, is exactly right, technically. Um, finding the darkest pixel brings that to zero, they increase the, uh, the contrast. That's a very, very efficient way to occupy the intensity space. Um, but as a human operator, without the help of image processing programs, it's difficult to achieve. But mathematically, you're exactly right. If, if, you have the, if you have already taken the image, you definitely can do that in terms of image processing. Because then you can just multiply uh, the intensity by 255 over your highest value, right? And use the entire intensity space? Exactly, exactly. Assume I have 254. Right, in, in 8-bit, yeah. Yeah, in 8-bit, yeah, 254. 
and the 255. In this case, if you plus to the identity matrix, then you'll have everything like just 255, 255. And in this case, you have zero contrast in that. Uh, we can only look at the images within the intensity space. Once it's outside the intensity space, it will be either zero or 255. In this case, there is a special term. It's called oversaturation. Like if, if you go over 255. That, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Is reducing brightness too much under saturation then or? Uh, I have never heard people say under saturation. I would speculate like if we have over saturation, then we should have under saturation. Um, I, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I guess it's still just a form of saturation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I guess it's just zero intensity. Like, we don't get any information if it's all zero. Um, in, the, in the binary world, like zero is uh, black, um, uh, it's dark, one is bright. Then in the 8-bit uh, the images, then zero is dark, then 255 is the brightest value you can get. So if it's below zero, can we say under saturation? I don't know, maybe it's just no signals or just pitch dark. We're just losing, We're losing some data from, from yeah, that. Yeah, 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 exactly. When, when you, when you um, increase the bright, brightness by too much or reduce the brightness by too much, you're losing information. You're losing information. Information is valuable only when you can see differences. For example, if I have, uh, um, I just give you one example. That's a very good, very good point from you. Uh, if I give you one example, if I have a, a really large uh, picture that's like 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, but if there's only one value. It's, if it's only zero in all the entries, then it will be pitch dark. In terms of the information it carries, it's the same as one by one with a one by one matrix with a single entry zero. Only when you introduce differences in the matrix or in the, in the, in the image, that difference carries information. And as you were saying, if we overexpose or when we subtract the, the number so much to a level that you have so many zeros, then we're losing information. We are reducing the information the image carries. Very good comment, very good comment. Any other questions or comments? I'll challenge you actually. Um, initially, I gave you the, uh, the example uh, in the opposite way, uh, we have the, uh, or we had the, uh, the bright background with a, a dark spot. Then I'll leave it to you to think about how to occupy the intens intensity space as much as possible without losing information. Okay, any questions about brightness and the contrast before we go to gamma correction? Uh, right, one and two. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I assume there's no questions, so let's look at gamma correction. In brightness and the contrast, as you can see, it's linear algebra. Like uh, you either do addition, subtraction, or you do multiplication or division. Gamma correction is a non-linear approach. It's a non-linear correction. Which has certain advantages. The math is very simple. So we have the intensity output equals to intensity input, then to the power of gamma. So the math is very simple. If we draw, if we draw the uh, the input versus output graph we'll get something like this. If gamma is equal to one, 
the input will be equal to output. So it will be a straight line. There's not much we can do. Input, and this is output. Okay. If we have gamma greater than one, we'll have a curve like this. Sorry, this is gamma equals one. If we, if we have gamma greater than one, we'll have curve looks like this, and this is gamma greater than one. And if gamma is, is less than one, then we'll have a curve something like this. Of course, like these curves are not unique. For example, by playing with gamma, um, assume this is 0.5, then 0.8, will be something like this. Will be something in between. Then this is gamma is 0.8. Um, the two blue lines I drew here, those are just something representative. Then what does this tell you? What does this tell you? Let's look at the gamma less than one example in details. So intensity, initially, when we have a small increase in the intensity from here to here. In the linear scale, we increase that from here to here. When we have like intensity from something low intensity to high intensity, but with gamma correction, with gamma correction, we'll have something like this, sorry, this point and this point will have something like this. This will be the new output. Then we have a dramatic increase in the, in the, uh, in the output intensity. Let me correct this slightly to make sure it's not misleading. Let me say, say that again. So initially, initially, we have one intensity here, that's intensity low, and this is intensity high. If it's, if it's linear scale, then this will be the output readout. How much we increase in the axis will have the same amount of increment in the y-axis. However, by reducing the gamma, we have the, uh, the upper blue curve, then the intensity difference from low to high as input will give you a dramatic increase in the output. So when we have something dark, by reducing the gamma, you can easily differentiate something is dark in, or in the dark region. It took me a while to really understand what's going on when I first encountered the other concept. Does this make sense? So small differences in the lower end of the intensity bar of the intensity space is exaggerated, is kind of like magnified. So assume in the picture you have a lot of things in dark at night if you take a picture um, um, or the lighting's not so great, you take a picture, like the trees are black, the, the, the mountains in the background are black, people are black, it will be just like a dark blob of everything. But different things may have slightly different intensities. If you want to tell those are the mountains in the background, those are the trees, that's like a person, then you can reduce gamma to enhance those small differences. Then with a the large gamma, what happens is if a lot of things, they are overexposed, a lot of things they are over, uh, I wouldn't say overexposed, it's a wrong term to use. A lot of things they are, they have high intensity. Um, you look into the sky, like, you know, uh, everything's really bright. Then you want to tell them apart. In this case, you use gamma larger than one. A small, difference here will lead to a large difference 
from here to here. So by doing the long linear correction on your matrix, on your image, you can make either very dark features visible or you can, e you can more easily differentiate dark features or by increasing gamma, you can differentiate the bright features. Any questions before I show you one example? It's a TEM image, but uh, the same idea is applied to SEM micrographs. This image was taken by my student De Xin, and you can see um, this is a sample and a lot of dark areas, a lot of dark areas. If we play brightness and the contrast first, so let's go to image, then adjust, brightness contrast. This image is 8-bit, and you can tell it's from 0 to, to, to uh, 255. If we change brightness, so this is adding a constant number to the system, and eventually it will overexpose, and everything looks like, especially here, everything looks like a bright blob. So this is brightness. Let me just go to the other extreme. This is to reduce the brightness, and a lot of areas is turned pitch dark. This is contrast, so this is to multiply a constant to the image. So if we increase contrast, you can see a lot of things becomes pitch dark. This is because the uh, intensity for many pixels are really low. When you multiply something less than zero, it's getting closer and closer than zero. And we cannot tell the, uh, the differences anymore. Then this is the opposite of reducing contrast. Everything just looks like a gray blob. Okay. So this is brightness and the contrast. Let's look at gamma. Maybe I've got to reset, or I don't have to. Let me double check. The brightness contrast. So just reset that back to uh, back to the original state. Brightness contrast. Would it be incorrect to kind of think of gamma almost kind of like a, a darkening factor? What, sorry, sorry, what do you mean by incorrectly using gamma as a darkening factor? No, no, like would it be incorrect to think of it as like a darkening factor, like greater than one and will make it almost as if the image was taken in a, with less light. And then if it's less than one, it's fraction, that would imply that it would almost kind of brighten the image as if there was slightly more light. It just uh, seems like I, a way to uh, think about it. Actually, I think your description is really good. Um, it, it, it brightens the image in the non-linear way. It darkens the image in the non-linear way. That's what gamma does. You're exactly right. Like, you are changing, like, what you see. You, you're, like, you're, you're brightening that up, or you're, you're, you're darkening your image. You, you darken the image, but in the non-linear way. So I, I think it's, it's, it's right to, to, to say like what you said just now. That's very good. So in the, uh, in the gamma correction, it's in process, you go to math. There are many things you can do. And there's gamma. In image J, um, the predefined value is 0.5. So let's just bring that back to one. then click on preview. Now let's increase and decrease gamma. So let's increase gamma first. So this is what you see when you increase gamma. Uh, what was that Daniel who said, uh, like the darkening and the brightening effect? Or it was another student? That uh, kills me. It, it was you, okay. As Daniel said, as you can see, this is like the darkening effect. And for this image, it's not good because we have a lot of things that are dark. But if we go the opposite direction, let's reduce gamma. It's getting better, getting better. Now it's less than one. Let's keep reducing. 
and you start seeing all the details in that dark blob now. So gamma is a really powerful way. If you cannot correct your image using brightness and contrast, you can always play with gamma to make, um, to reveal certain microstructural features you're interested in. Let me go to the slides I prepared for this class. Okay. Um, in the first part of today's class, we discussed beam alignment. We talked about focus, astigmatism, and column alignment. For astigmatism, uh, this is most non intuitive especially for students who do not wear glasses. So for astigmatism, for astigmatism, the figure in the center or the figures in the center, these are without astigmatism. The, the figures on the left and on the right, they are with astigmatism. And you can see when astigmatism is present in the instrument, you see streaking. The images are stretched in one direction. What you want to do is to use the stigmator to remove the streaking in the images. So that's stimulation. Okay. We also talked about like you know different bits of images. Then from one bit to 32 bits. One bit you have two options, only two colors. Then two bits, you start seeing more information in this image. Then four bits, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Then eight bits, 32 bits. To human eyes, to human eyes, like at least I cannot tell the difference from 8 bits to 32 bits. But if we do image processing, maybe this information is important to algorithms like machine learning or deep learning, that kind of things. From 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, the difference is dramatic. Human eyes can easily tell the difference, but from 8 to 16 to 32, it's not as dramatic anymore. But the information is there, just not human, just human eyes are not sensitive enough to tell the differences. Uh, we also talked about gamma. So I took the image from uh, Wikipedia. So this is gamma equals to two. Uh, actually, let's look at uh, the original first. So that's the original image, a girl in the, uh, the water. And when you increase gamma, that's gamma equals to two, um, a lot of information is lost. So you can see this is part of the reef, it's gone. But as you reduce gamma to half, one third, 14, then we start highlighting the reef in the background. But when you further reduce gamma, you lose the information of the reef. You don't see much contrast anymore. So this is one example from Wikipedia. Personally, I really like the next example. So this is a GIF. Again, I found in, um, from Google. So this is a, a photograph of a puppy. And that's what happens as you change gamma. G here is gamma. So 0.1, you don't really see much. 0.5, then 1, 1.5, 2. And again, by playing with these parameters in the image, you can highlight or you can reveal reveal certain features you want to reveal. Any questions? Uh, I think we finished the, uh, the class on time today. Uh, any questions before uh, the, uh, the lab session?